In today's video, I'm going to be doing quite a fun project where I build my own RGB TV backlight. For TV backlights, there's a lot of different options on the market. Obviously, you can buy a Philips TV with Ambilight built in, but I don't really want to do that, A, because TVs are expensive, and B, because even if I replace my TV in the future, I don't want to be tied into constantly buying Philips TVs. I want to have a decent range of TVs to choose from. There are systems that take HDMI, such as the Philips Hue Sync box, and then a sort of system from LightMe that seems to be a bit newer, LightMe Neo or something it's called. The Philips Hue system is just far too expensive for what it, for what it is. I mean, I understand obviously there's going to be expensive ASICs in there and it can do high, you know, high quality 4K60 and stuff like that. But you're paying a good couple of hundred just for the sync box. Then you need an RGB LED strip, which also has to be a Hue one. And then in addition to that, you need a Hue hub, which I don't have. So it would cost an absolute fortune for me to go down that route. The LightMe Neo looks good but it can only take 4K, 4K30 inputs, whereas I use 4K60. And while you can use external scalers, I'm not sure how it would act with things like HDR content. I wanted a bit more flexibility. There's other options out there that use cameras, such as the Govee system, and I think Ambivision, where it essentially point a camera at the TV, the camera looks at the TV, works out where the colors are, and uses that to control the LEDs. Those are also good options. And in fact, that's the only way you can really do it if you want the backlight to respond to video being generated by the TV, so either by its built-in tuner or its smart functionality, because the device I'm building will only work with an HDMI input. But again, I didn't want a camera pointing at the TV, I wanted something a bit more discreet. And I don't mind it only working with HDMI. My TV itself is a smart TV, but it's pretty slow, so I'm happy just to get an external Android TV box or something and use that. And I don't really use the built-in TV tuner, I tend to use an external HDMI satellite box anyway, so it doesn't really bother me that it won't work for the TV's built-in functionality. So I've decided to build my own. And for that, I'll be using open source software called Hyperion. Well, technically I won't be using Hyperion, I'll be using software called HyperHDR, which is a fork of Hyperion, but we'll go into that later as well. But essentially what I'll be doing is building my own backlight system that'll take an HDMI input and control the LEDs behind the TV. And this system is actually going to be fairly inexpensive, way cheaper than the Hue system. We're probably looking at maybe £100 or so to build all this, so definitely much better value than the Hue system. So let's take a look at all the hardware we'll be using. So first up, we need a way to get that HDMI input captured and into a computer for processing. So for that, I've picked up this cheap 4K HDMI capture card from Amazon. It's amazing how cheap 4K HDMI capture cards have got. This one, its RRP is about £30, and at the time that I bought it, it was a voucher code, so I paid £15 for this. And it'll do the job fine. I maybe wouldn't use it for super high quality stuff if it was good quality was critical, but it'll work for what we're doing here. And essentially all it does is take an HDMI input and connect to the computer over USB, which weirdly is a USB-A connector. You know, that's the wrong sort of connector for a device like this. You need to use an USB-A to USB-A cable to connect to a computer, but that works. Various audio inputs and outputs as well that I won't be using. And this also has HDMI pass-through, which could be useful for some people. In many setups, what you might want to do is connect your HDMI source into here, then connect the output out to your TV, and that means that this will pass the HDMI through, so you don't need to worry about splitting it. Now, in my situation, I'm not going to do that, and that's because I rely heavily on HDMI ARC and HDMI CEC, especially CEC because my satellite box is hidden away in a cupboard, and I use the TV remote to control it over CEC. And unfortunately for my testing, this does block CEC, it doesn't pass through properly. And for me, I have an AV receiver that has a second HDMI output, so I'd much rather connect this into the, HD, the AV receiver's second HDMI output. And then that just totally means that this, there's no interruption or splitting going on the signal that goes to the TV, that's just connected directly to the receiver. So I won't actually be using this pass-through, but it is there if you want it. But yeah, for my setup, this will be connected to the secondary output from my AV receiver. And I needed a 4K60 capture card because my receiver does have the two outputs, but they have to output the same resolution and frame rate. So I couldn't use a 1080p capture card because then the TV would also run in 1080p. So I picked this up and yeah, this can take a 4K60 input and it'll capture it. Now, I'm not sure if this will actually capture it at 4K. Some of these will pass through 4K, but when they capture, they capture it at 1080p. This does say to USB 3.04 K, but when I looked at it in OBS, it didn't show 4K as an option, but I might have been doing it wrong. But to be honest, for me, I really don't care whether this can actually capture 4K or not. The actual capturing resolution I'll be doing will be something like, not like 640 by 480, but whatever the 16 by 9 version of that will be. I'll be capturing at a super low resolution just to reduce the CPU load. But yeah, 
as long as it can take a 4K input and get it into a computer somehow, this is ideal. Now you'll notice here that there's no sort of Raspberry Pi, which a lot of people use for Hyperion setups. And that's because I won't be using any sort of separate computer, separate Raspberry Pi or anything like that. In my AV cabinet, I have a perfectly good Mac Mini that I use for like AV stuff, just watching content and stuff like that. And it sits right below the AV receiver. So I don't really see a reason to use a separate Pi for this because th there's a perfectly good computer there right next to the receiver. So that's what I'll be doing. I'll be plugging this into my Mac Mini, running Hyper HDR or Hyperion on that, and that'll do the job perfectly. However, this makes things a bit tricky because with a lot of Hyperion setups, people connect their LED strips straight into the Raspberry Pi's GPIO. Now, even if I was using a Pi, I couldn't really do that because as I mentioned, I want to be connecting the capture card to my AV receiver's secondary HDMI output. But my TV is mounted on the wall away from the AV receiver with a single HDMI cable that runs through the wall to the TV. So I couldn't really do that. If I wanted to connect, say, the LED strip directly into a Pi, I'd either have to run a second HDMI cable to up behind the TV so I could have the HDMI feed there to go into the capture card, or I'd have to like extend the, the LED cables way through the wall back to behind the AV receiver, and again, that would be a nightmare. So that's not what we're going to be doing. We're going to be doing it over Wi-Fi, so we'll take a look at that in a second. So let's take a look at the other bits we've got here first. So we've got the LED strip. This is just a basic WS2812B RGB LED strip. These are very common. It's probably one of the more common types. And yeah, it's just a bunch of RGB, individually addressable LEDs. This one here I went for is 60 LEDs a meter. You get different ones. You get 60, 30, and I think 144. 60 seems like a good balance. 30 LEDs a meter you could maybe get away with if your TV is quite far away from the wall because it'll give space for the, LED, for the light to disperse. But my TV is completely flat to the wall, so I wanted them to be closer together. Of course, you pay a little bit more for that, but the price difference isn't terrible. Going for the even more dense ones could have been another option, but when you've got that many LEDs, you're going to require a huge power supply to power it, so I didn't want to do that, so yeah. 60 LEDs a meter. And obviously anything shown in this video will be linked in the description. So yeah, that's the strip I've gone for. There are other options you can use. There's the older ones like this, I think it's WS2811 and things like that, but you need to be a bit careful because some of those use external chips. With these, the chip is built into the LED. The older ones use an external chip. And on some of the LED strips, there's one chip per three LEDs, which means that the LEDs are, like, are LEDs are like addressable in three LED groups. They're not individually addressable. So that's why I went for these ones. There's also more modern ones, I think SK and then I can't remember the number, six, six, I can't remember, but it starts with SK. Those are RGBW, so the LEDs have a white element. I was actually really tempted to go for one of those because it would give better whites. However, ultimately I settled on this because the cost difference was quite significant and I couldn't find any stock of ones with cool white LEDs. And for white behind the TV, you're kind of going to want to need like 6,000 Kelvin, and all I could find was like 4,000 Kelvin, which wasn't going to be cool enough. So I've just settled for the cheaper RGB ones. So yeah, that's the LED strips there. I've gone for 5 meters, I won't need all of that, but it wasn't too expensive. So yeah, that's the LED strip. Now, to power the LED strip, we need a power supply. Now, this is where you need to be quite careful. Your LED strip will usually give a rating in about in sort of watts per meter, and this is 14 watts a meter. I think I could get away with about a 50 watt power supply, but just to be on the safe side, I got a 75 watt one, so that's it here. And it's a 75 watt, 5 volt power supply, so 15 amps. It's a fairly cheap one, it's not amazing, but it'll do the job, I'm thinking. And yeah, just goes to a little barrel jack there. So you'll need a power supply like this. If you're going for something even bigger, then you have to look into things like the big open frame power supplies in the hundreds of watts range. But thankfully with this, I can just use a smaller power brick, which will do the job. Because these LEDs, even though they're LED, will use quite a bit of power just because there's so many of them. We've got some boring cable clips here that are just boring. And then we've got some cables here, which... How beautiful my life will be with you. That's the nicest thing an LED, a bag of cables has ever said to me. Yeah, that's... I love these slogans. But yep, got some cables here. And all these do is they're just designed to connect the LED strips without soldering. So you can just open these there. LED strip and clip in there and you can just seal it up. So I'll be using these on the corners. You can technically just fold these LED strips in the corners but because I've got 60 LEDs a meter that I don't fancy folding that you're going to end with LEDs caught in the fold and you can get solid corners that kind of have a flex cable so they're just like that but they've got a flex cable between them or a bit you know flat flex but those look quite large and I want to be able to put these as close together as possible if not even like overlap them to make the corners small. 
So I've gone for these with cables in the middle and I can just do that and then kind of clip the cables out of the way behind the TV. I'll also need another one of these where I'll cut an end off and solder it on so I'll show you that why I'm doing that later. But yeah, just another little bag of cables. And then finally we've got one of the more interesting bits. And that's because, as I mentioned, the all the processing and capture is done by a Mac Mini in my AV cabinet and the LED strip is going to be behind the TV. So I need a way to control this wirelessly. And Hyperion supports a thing called WLED. WLED is an open source project and it's just firmware designed to run on small microcontrollers like the ESP8266, ESP32, things like that. Where you can take like your little Wemos D1 Mini and things like that, connect it to an LED strip, flash a WLED firmware, and it lets you connect that LED strip to Wi-Fi and control it over the network. So that would be a perfectly viable option and lots of people will do that. Just get your little ESP microcontroller, solder it all together and it'll work. But I've decided to do something a little bit different here. And that is by this little thing here, which is an SP501E. And this is a cheap Wi-Fi LED controller. It's designed for use with an app called Fairy Nest. And it's one of those, you know, generic cloud things. You take it, you connect it to your Wi-Fi, it connects this server somewhere and you, your app connects to the server and you, all your LED commands go through the internet and I uh, don't really like that. But the benefit of this is internally, this just contains a little ESP microcontroller. I don't know exactly which model it is, but it is just an ESP and it can be flashed with WLED. So even though this costs a little bit more than doing it with one of the bare ESP boards, this costs about 10.99. The benefit of this is this comes with a like, really nice little case. It's got a barrel jack the power supply can connect directly into. It's got a connector there that the LED strip can connect straight into. It's just a much nicer all-in-one solution. So yeah, this is what we're going to be doing. We're going to take this, flash the WLED firmware onto it, plug that into the LED strip, plug the power supply in, and all this can hide behind the TV and make this LED strip accessible over my local network. So Hyperion can run on the, on the Mac Mini, it can take the video feed from the capture card, do all the processing, send a network stream over the network, into this, and that will control the LED strip. So it should be dead simple. So now without any further ado, let's get going with this. Now I will say I'm not going to be doing this as a full tutorial. I'll kind of go into a bit of detail about each bit I'm doing, but I'm learning this at the same time as I'm showing it on video, so I'm probably not the biggest expert in it. I'm not going to go into huge amounts of detail and show exactly how to do it, but I'll kind of just show what I'm doing as I'm going along. So yeah, time to start and figure out, well, where to start. Okay, so the first thing I want to do is flash this and test it out, just making sure this actually works, because once this is flashed and working, I can then start actually installing the LED strip on the TV. But before I take this apart and flash it, I'm just going to check it works, because obviously if it's dead on arrival, I don't want to then flash it, void the warranty and not be able to return it, because this wasn't super cheap. I mean, 1099 is not deadly, but it's a lot more expensive than just buying a little ESP. So we'll take that. We've got the LED strip here, so we just plug it in. And this is why I like this, because it's just such a nice solution. You know, with other solutions, you're having to, like, solder stuff, you know, bare wires, all this sort of stuff. And then for behind the TV, this will be so much neater just stuck on the back of the TV rather than a bare PCB with wires sticking out and I'll inevitably damage it when I'm trying to plug something in. So that's connected there. So hopefully if you just plug this in, power supply's already plugged into mains, that should, yep, there we go, turn on. So that's turned on, it's all flashing all rainbow colours. So that's making me happy that this works and it also shows that my power supply works as well. Because obviously, you know, none of this comes in a kit, so I was like hoping that power supply would work with this and hoping the connectors would fit. So yeah, it all does. And as I keep mentioning, I'll put links to all the stuff I bought because obviously I've kind of validated that this stuff's compatible. Little power button there, presume that, yeah, turns on and off. And obviously right now this will probably be broadcasting a Wi-Fi network that you connect to and then you install an app or something like that, but I won't be doing that. I'll be flashing the firmware. So yeah, with that all working, what we need to do is take all this, disconnect it all, and pop this open and flash it. Okay, so here we have the little SP501E. So pop it open and see what's inside. It's not even stuck together, it literally just unclips super easily, so super easy to get inside. And there's the board. And if we just pop this out, there's just strain relief on these cables. Board will just lift out. Like that. And that's it there. It's dead simple. So up here, we've got an ESP8285, which is just a little chip. It's like an ESP8266, but it's got built-in flash memory rather than having an external chip. So very simple ESP chip that can easily be flashed. And then down here, you can see all the wires connected. So here you've got the DC input that goes onto these terminals here. And these are just basically passed straight through to the output. So the voltage output on this connector here is just the input just passed straight out. 
but it'll also power itself from that input. And what's quite neat is that this can take anywhere between 5 and 24 volts. So irrespective of the voltage of your LED strip, this is a 5 volt LED strip, but if you had a 24 volt or whatever, you can still feed that voltage into this. This will convert the power enough to power its own chip, but then the higher voltage will be passed to the output to power your strip. So that's a really neat solution. And obviously you can see there the green wire on the output is obviously the data line that goes to the LEDs. So yeah, it's dead simple. And what is quite interesting here is you'll see there's these additional pins down here, CBRG. And that's because this board is also able to drive RGB LED strips. So this is for individually addressable RGB LED strips. And this is just for the traditional ones that are just all light up the same colour and you have separate wires going to the strip for red, green and blue. Now obviously this one's configured for addressable and all the former would be flashing is presumably for the addressable ones. But it's just quite neat that they have kind of at least made the board so it could be configured differently to control different types of LED strips. But yeah, that's the board there. Mm. But if you look on the underside, this is what we need. And that's these pads here. Because these are just essentially serial connections. So what I can do is just solder some wires onto this, connect them up to a USB to serial adapter, and flash the firmware on. And this is all documented on the WLED wiki on GitHub, so hopefully those instructions work. And I can flash the firmware onto this. Okay, so the solder is complete. So I just did what it says on the website. All I've done is just soldered a few wires onto the bottom there, onto these pads. And basically all you've got is you've got three volts. These two are transmit and receive. Can't remember which way they are, but one's transmit, one's receive. And then the last two just both need to be pulled to ground. So I've got those four wires coming off and then going into my USB TTL serial adapter. Now the one thing that is quite important with this is that this ESP is 3.3 uh, volts, not 5 volts. And I've mentioned this before and some people have said it's fine with 5 volts, but at least on the data lines, but I wouldn't trust it. So with this, this adapter is actually configurable, so it's set to 3.3 volts, which means the ESP is being powered off the 3.3 volt output and the data lines are running at 3.3 volts as well, just to be safer. So that is now ready to flash. Now, one thing I just discovered after buying all this is that WLED don't provide official builds of the firmware for this particular device. However, I did find a third party build, which seems to be fine, it just seems to be a mirror. I'll put links in the description if I remember. And they've got a firmware build of WLED for the particular SP501E. However, what was a bit concerning is on the WLED wiki, it mentions that this has one megabyte of flash and that later revisions have two megabytes of flash. And the firmware image I found was for a two megabyte flash chip. So we need to see what firm, what size of flash this has, because even though it, I'd hope it's a new revision, you know, you don't want this to be sitting around in Amazon's warehouse. So plug it into the laptop and check, so we can just stick it into my little dongle here. Plug that into the laptop. And we're just going to run software called ESP Tool. Um, I do apologise for the laptop that's absolutely covered in fingerprints. But this is just the ESP tool, there's a serial port that's plugged into, and this will just run the flash ID command, which will tell me what flash this has. So we can run that. There we go. And there we go, we can see it has two megabytes of flash. So that's the ideal. So I can use that pre-compiled binary. If it came to it, it is very much possible just to build it yourself. There's loads of resources on how to do it. And you can build it for a one megabyte chip. You just lose a few features around OTA updates and stuff like that. But I'd rather not have to do that. It's a lot of dependencies to install and a bit of a faff. So that's good. I can just use the official, well, the unofficial, but the pre-built one from that other GitHub repository. So yeah, time to flash this. Okay, so now this is the moment of truth. I've got it all connected as before. I actually unplugged it and replugged it in just to make sure it's fully reset itself after running that flash test. I've opened up ESP Home Flasher. Again, there's loads of documentation for how to install this, but it's available in Python's pip um, package manager. Open that up, I pick the serial port this is connected to, pick the flash file that I've downloaded, and in theory, if I press flash ESP, this will work. There we go, serial port's flashing away. Raising flash, that's scary. It's writing. Serial ports are flashing, the LEDs on the USB adapter are flashing away. I will just intensely watch this because this could be 10 quid down the drain if I brick it. Wrote, and flashing is complete. So hopefully that has flashed WLED onto that USB adapter. So time to take it out, power it up and well, see if it works. 
Okay, so now moment of truth. Have I broken this? So I've left these wires connected just in case I need to reflash it. I've just taken off the white one because that one had to go between two different pads to connect it to ground. And connecting one of these to ground was to sort of put it into programming mode. So I've disconnected that just so it's not in programming mode. But the others are there just in case I need to flash it again. But in theory, we'll connect an LED strip to see if it does anything. And then what should happen is when I power this up, it should start broadcasting an access point I should be able to connect to. And it'll serve a web interface I can manage it from. So let's see. Put that in there. Now, that is a very good sign, annoyingly off camera, but the LEDs have come on, but they're working differently. They came on a sort of orangey colour and then cycled and flashed and went green. Now, that's different to what it did before. So this is making me a bit more confident because it's, they've clearly got some sort of signal because they did do a pattern when they turned on, which shows the chip is doing something. And it's different from before, which shows the firmware has changed. So hopefully, if I get my phone out, this should maybe work. So let's... Check the Wi-Fi settings on my phone. See if it shows up. Yep, it's showing up on my phone as WLEDAP, so let's connect to that. Now oh, it needs a password, that's helpful. What's the password? Does it say on the internet? WLED1234. So I put the password in. Like that, so I put the password into my phone. Connect. See what happens. Good, I've got a sign into network thing. And there we go. That is WLED running on the device here. So that's perfect. So obviously there's future setup I'll need to do here. I'll need to actually connect it to my Wi-Fi because currently this is broadcasting its own AP. But yeah, I mean, that's ideal. So what we can now do is take all these wires off, tidy this up a bit, get it back in its case and proceed with the project. Okay, so it's working now. I've been able to go into the settings on this and get it connected to my Wi-Fi network. And we can pull up the WLED web interface on my network. Go through it, so like effects, there's different effects you can go into here. So yeah, it's all working. So yeah, definitely very happy with that. Now before I go away and actually just start installing LEDs on TV and stuff like that, there's one more modification I want to do to this. And that is around powering it. So we unplug that there. Obviously we're going to be powering it from this here, going into this pre-soldered connector on this end. However, with the LED strips, you need to be careful of voltage drop. The longer the strip, the more the voltage drops across the strip. And that means that the LEDs at the end of the strip from the, way, from the end that the power is being fed in will be slightly dimmer than the LEDs at the start. And that's compounded with lower voltage strips. Generally, if you're installing LEDs in, say, a building, you know, under cabinet lights, lights around a room, stuff like that, you're going to use 12 volt or 24 volt LED strips. You generally use 24 volt for longer runs. But this is only a 5 volt strip, and that's fairly standard for these RGB ones, or these individually addressable RGB ones that means that the voltage drop is going to be quite significant. It won't cause a problem. I mean, as you can see when I was testing it, the whole strip was lighting up and that's 5 metres and I'll be using less than that on the TV. But the issue is, if you were to power it from one end, run it around a TV, what you'll then have is at one corner, you'll have this end and the far end next to each other. And that means that you're going to have the brightest LED and the dimmest LED totally adjacent to each other. And that sort of gap, that step, could be quite noticeable. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to make it so I can feed power into both ends. Now to do that, I'm going to use one of these connectors here. I'm going to cut one end off and solder onto these wires here. These two that stick out here. Now what these wires are is they're just designed to feed an additional voltage into the LED strip. So if your power supplier or whatever you're connecting this to wasn't powerful enough, you can stick 5 volts in here. But just obviously because these are just tapped on top of this, this will be feeding 5 volts in and the 5 volts will be will appear on these wires here. So my plan will be to solder one of these onto these, cutting out the data line, I won't use the data line, and that'll give me a connection that I can put onto the far end of the LED strip to inject 5 volts at the far end as well. So what that'll mean is the LED strip will be powered from both ends, and that'll get rid of that big jump. Of course there'll still be voltage drop across the strip, but rather than it being at the far end, the voltage drop, or the dimmest LED, will be at the middle of the strip. And then as the LEDs sort of become closer to the power source from that middle point, they'll slowly get brighter. And that means that even though one corner of the TV will technically be dimmer than the other corner, because it's not a big step, you won't really notice it like you would if it was like one, the brightest is next to the dimmest. What you'll end up with is the dimmest is next to the second dimmest and then the third dimmest and so on. So it won't be as big a jump. So yeah, what you need to do is take this, solder this onto here, and when we install it, I'll show you how to connect that up, just feed power into the strip from both ends. 
But yeah, the thing to remember is even though I'm connecting both ends up, one end gets power and data, and that'll send data in the direction of the arrows. The other end just gets power. You don't put data into the other end. So yeah, time to do that. Okay, it's time to solder that on. We just need one of these strips here. So one of these wires. Yep, there we go. There we go again. How beautiful my life will be with you. Yep. These LED strips, these wires love, absolutely love me, so I'm just gonna absolutely destroy one of them. There we go. I have killed it. <laughs> but yeah. Yep, so your life probably wasn't as wasn't what you expected, but yeah, there we go. So I've cut that end off there. Strip these off and solder it all on. Okay, so there we go. So I've now soldered that together. So all I've done is just splice that on there. Just a bit of heat shrink, nothing fancy at all. But what this means is now I've got this connector here that goes into the Wi-Fi adapter, and this connector here that will connect onto the other end of the LED strip. So I'll put this around the TV, and then this will connect onto that other end. Pop open that. You can see how it just connects onto the join that goes between two pieces on the strip, and that'll power it from both ends. And obviously because it's going around a square TV or rectangular TV, the this end and then the far end will be at the same corner, so it'll be really easy to connect that up. So yeah, all I need to do now is go off and get this strip on the back of the TV, and I'll come back when I've done that. Okay, so I've now put the LED strip around the back of the TV. It was a bit fiddly because this TV is a really annoying shape for it, but I've got it on. So it just runs along the top, down the sides. It's actually quite good, at least at this part, because this TV's got a sort of metal trim around it, so that'll be good for heat sinking, although the rest of it's plastic. But, yep, it goes around there. You can see in the top right there, I've basically clipped the loop of cable back. Now, the bottom and the bottom two corners were a bit fiddly, because what you've kind of got here is I've had to like stack the two adapters and try and tuck this cape wire out of the way, so it's, it's not ideal, but hopefully it won't be too visible. The difficulty with this TV though is because you've got this slope, so it comes along, slopes up, then it's here, and then it goes on the back, so this might look a bit funny because the angle changes and the depth distance to the wall changes, but we'll see how I get on. Hopefully it'll be fine. And then it runs along the bottom. So yeah, it's all pretty good. Then up in the far corner here, we can see we've got the Wi-Fi adapter connected. I just clipped it all on just to keep it neat. And then you can see here, we've got the output of this goes into this ribbon cable here, which connects onto this strip here, which is the first LED, runs along the back, around the corner, comes back up here, and on the end here, we've got that additional five volts feeding in. I had a slight difficulty with this because when I first, because when I made it up, I just didn't look, and it turns out the polarity on these connectors is different on each side. So if we face the same side up on each side, you can see the polarity is reversed from one side to the other. And that totally caught me out because I didn't think and cut, cut it off, and of course it was the wrong one which meant the polarity of this was not correct for the LED strip. And I'm really glad I noticed that, because if I'd put that on the wrong way around, I'd have probably short-circuited something and it would have gone bang. Because I don't think this stuff probably has particularly good protection. So I had to end up redoing this and then put, put another end on, but that's worked fine. I don't think the voltage drop really would be an issue, because I measured it, and at the start you get about 5.07 volts, by the end it was like 4.7 volts. So it's definitely dropping something, but it wasn't really enough to make a noticeable difference. But I thought I may as well connect it anyway, and I did, and now you get 5 volts, or 5.07 volts, on the first two LEDs in this corner. And that just means it will definitely be even, which is good. So yeah, that's all done. So what I need to do is get this TV back on the wall, and of course be very careful, because it's now got these very fragile LEDs around it. There's different types of LED strip you can get. You can get the IP rated stuff. I didn't go for it, and... But from what I can see, apparently not going for IP rated stuff is potentially better for lifespan because it doesn't get as hot. If it's coated with gel or whatever, it can get hotter. But if you've got a TV that you're potentially going to be like rummaging behind a lot or it's on an arm that you're going to be grabbing and pulling it out from the wall, you might want to consider one of the IP rated strips purely just because it'll protect the LEDs because, of course, this is a little bit more vulnerable. But yeah, that's all in there. Time to get the TV back on the wall and set up Hyperion. Okay, so the TV's back on the wall and the LEDs are powered up. And if you look down the back there, I've just got it plugged into the socket here. So the socket here, that powers the TV, that powers the LED strip. And then just down there, you might be able to make out, is the power brick. Just stuffed down the back there. That's neat enough. And yeah, we now have all the LEDs along the top. So if we come around here, we can see if we look around the back. We have all the LEDs around the back of the TV. And they seem pretty secure. They're, they're not, you know, there's a couple of bits of tape starting to come off a little bit, but hopefully it doesn't peel off. If it does, all I would do is just get additional clips and stick it in. So... That's fine. And that is providing the backlight behind the TV. And like before, if we look around the back here, we've just got a little Wi-Fi adapter just hanging off the back of the, LED, back of the TV there. And then the power cable connects into there, and that cable goes out to the LED strip. So, yep, that's installed behind the TV.
Next up in my AV cabinet, we can see we have the capture card. Now, it's just currently sort of hanging out the front here and the cable's running a bit messy. That's just temporary. I'll sort it all properly now. But I've got this HDMI cable that comes out the second output of the AV receiver because it's got the two outputs. One goes to the TV, one comes out here. And that cable just comes down here and into the capture card. And then the USB from the capture card goes into my Mac Mini. So yeah, that's the HDMI setup. And yeah, obviously eventually I'll get all the cables hidden away and it'll be a bit neater. But yeah, that's the capture card there. So the next step was to set up Hyper HDR and configure the LED strip. So first of all what I had to do was log on to the WLED webpage that's served from the wireless LED controller and just set a few settings in there. The main one being setting how many LEDs there were because you had to count them and need to know how many to address. And also I had to go into the settings and turn off a power limit because it defaults having quite a low power limit designed for weak power supplies. And the problem is that was meaning that my LEDs were running at a super low brightness so I had to turn that off or at least increase the limit just to cater for the power supply I had because it's quite a powerful one. And that meant the LEDs ran at full brightness. Then for Hyper HDR, that was pretty easy. I just installed it on a Mac OS, obviously that will vary depending on what you're installing it on. Run the software, go to the web page, which is just a, another web page served from the, from the machine it's installed on. Go into settings on that. And what I needed to set up there was the LED settings where I tell it how many LEDs I have, how they're laid out. So basically how many along, are along the top and bottom, how many are up the sides of the TV. And then also tell it that I'm using WLED LEDs and give it the IP address of the WLED controller. All fairly simple. Then for the capture device, all I had to do was go in, pick the capture device, which in my case is the capture card, and that was really it. It basically worked straight off the bat. The only other real setting I needed to play with in here was the HDR colour mapping, and that's because if you feed an HDR signal into this capture card, the capture card doesn't read it as an HDR signal, and the colours will be very washed out. So this HDR colour mapping option adjusts the colours to, give them, to make the colours map work correctly if you're feeding an HDR signal in. This is one thing that's a little bit tricky though, because it depends on what source I'm feeding in. If I'm feeding an HDR source in, I need this to be turned on. But if I'm feeding a non-HDR source in, such as my satellite box, I need this to be turned off, otherwise the colours are oversaturated. This isn't the end of the world, because the Hyper HDR web interface is actually quite mobile responsive. So I've just got it bookmarked on my phone and I can quite quickly go on my phone and change it, change that option, it's not really a big problem. What I think I'll do in the future is I'll set up an integration with my AV receiver using Node-RED where I'll look at what input the AV receiver is set to and switch the HDR setting on and off accordingly because it's very much for me, it's dependent on what input the receiver's on. If it's set to the Mac Mini input, I want HDR to be enabled whereas if it's set to say the satellite receiver, I want it to be disabled. So that's something I'll do in the future. The only other setting I really needed to change was just the one that lets you specify how far in from the side of the screen the LEDs are. Just tweaked that a little bit and that meant that the LEDs were a bit better lined up with what was on the screen. And yeah, apart from that, it basically worked out of the box. I was really impressed with how quick the setup was. So now, let's take a look at it working. Okay, so here you can see it working. Now I've obviously darkened the room down just to make it look better on camera, but it still looks really good even in a fairly bright room. It still adds a lot to the picture. Now I'll run through some demo footage here. Unfortunately I don't want to risk showing any of the actual Ambilight demo videos I can find on YouTube just because of copyright. So I'm just going to go through some free stock footage I could find that's royalty free. It's maybe not going to be quite as impressive as some of the actual Ambilight demos. But I've tried to make a combination of videos here, some of which are really good at just showing off the bright colours and the dark background and the contrast. And some of which are more like real life TV watching. So they you know, what you can experience watching TV rather than sitting watching demos. So we'll start it off and take a look. So that's it running there. And you can see it works really well. What I've noticed with this is you can see it's quite high, almost high resolution because there's so many LEDs. So you can see distinct parts where like at the bottom on the right hand side it's a different colour to the top and it's the gradients work. It looks really effective. It also has lights along the bottom of the TV which official Philips Ambilight TVs don't have. Obviously you can't see it here because the bottom of the TV is dark, but you'll see it in future footage, and it works really well. This video here kind of shows how quick it tracks. So you can see the colours moving around the screen, and they follow very closely to the rotating image. It's actually really responsive, which impressed me, because I was thinking, you know, you're feeding the HDMI back in, you're having to capture it, process it, 
surely that's going to be slow because you know the video is coming out the same computer but it's actually pretty responsive in general tv watching things like this with like flashing lights make a huge difference it really adds to it it works really well but it's not really distracting and you can see there again it you know it tracks really well the motion it's really really good and in fact like a couple of weeks ago i actually saw a real Philips Ambilight TV mounted on the wall similar to this one, quite close to the wall. And it didn't have remotely the same level of resolution, you know, it didn't have nearly as many LEDs around the outside. So it kind of showed an ambient colour, but it wasn't like this where you can kind of see where that sign's flashing and see the red flashing above just that part of the picture. This is almost a much higher resolution than the actual Ambilight TVs, which you may or may not like, but I really like it. Next up we've got another demo here, more of a nature scene, and as you can see, when it's a bright picture, it's really bright, you know, you can see a lot, it really helps brighten it up, and it also really does improve the contrast. This TV isn't particularly high-end, it's just a standard LED TV and it's not got any sort of local dimming, where this really makes the contrast a much better and it definitely stops you seeing that backlight glowing through. It really makes a massive difference to the TV, so yeah, I'm very happy with it. The colour accuracy is also pretty good. It does vary. You, I do sometimes find that particularly dark colours that are maybe like a really dark green can come out, kind of come out quite bright green. So it, it's not accurate constantly, but you can see in a, a demo like this, it's pretty close. And it's never been to the point that I've been distracted or gone, wow, that's the wrong colour. You know, if, if you're looking for it, you might see the occasional colour accuracy issue mainly just dark colours coming out a bit more saturated than they really should be. But other than that, I'm really happy with the colour accuracy of this. Now finally we've got this demo here that we'll watch through, and this is more like a live TV, you know, it's cutting between different scenes that are kind of similar to each other, and it kind of feels, it, this is what you sort of see if you're watching live TV. And as you can see, it's both really responsive and like when you change between scenes, the, the, the whole screen updates quite quickly. There's not a lag where the picture updates and then, and then the backlight changes. You can see it is pretty accurate. And yeah, I'm just really impressed with it. I have had the occasional time where it's kind of slowed down. It's usually if something's happening on the machine in the background, I'll notice the backlight's lagging behind by a second and I'll go, oh, why is it doing that? And I'll have to close something that's running. So... I might move this onto Raspberry Pi in the future just to offload it onto another device that's definitely not going to be running anything else. But I'm really impressed with it. And running it on the Mac Mini, yeah, you have the occasional little performance glitch, but I'm pretty happy with it. So yeah, that's it working there. And I could not be happier with it. I was worried that this would be too distracting, you know, you're watching TV and it's constantly strobing and flashing in the background, but it's really not. It honestly does just feel like the screen's just kind of extended a little bit. It's it, it's re re it's responsive enough that you don't really notice it. It just really adds to the experience. And there have been times where it's maybe been turned off or it's not worked, it's not worked or whatever, so it's not running. And I'm looking going, something's missing from this. And then you turn it on and it makes a huge difference. So there you go. That was the demo of it working. It's probably a bit rambly, but hopefully you kind of get an idea of how it works. And yeah, I'm very impressed with it. Colour accuracy is really good. And it's also really high resolution, as I've said before. And it does seem a lot better than an actual Ambilight TV. So there you go, that was the demo of it all working. And hopefully you could see there that it actually works really well. It's really responsive, the colour accuracy is really good, it's really high resolution, you, know, you can actually see what item on the screen relates to what, it, what LED is coming out the side. It's not just like a wash of colour as like an average of the entire side of the screen, so it is really quite high resolution. And yeah, it's pretty good. The only real issue I've had is that if I change input on my AV receiver or I turn it all off and on again, sometimes the capture card won't pick up the video. What I then have to do is go onto the HyperHDR web page and toggle the USB capture setting on and off and that then fixes it. Similarly to using the HDR color space option, it's not the end of the world because it's quite easy just to grab my phone, open the web page and just change it on there, just toggle that setting. But what I think I'll do in the future is build something with Node Red that maybe looks at my AV receiver being turned on or off or switching input or maybe tries to see if HyperHDR is getting a video feed somehow and then it'll toggle the option for me using the API. This also might be down to my capture card. I can maybe get a different capture card that doesn't do that. 
or it might be because I'm using Mac OS. Maybe if I was running Linux on a Raspberry Pi, it might not have that issue. So a little bit of a quirk there where, yeah, changing inputs or turning things on and off can sometimes cause the video feed to drop out and it just, the LEDs just turn off. But I can perfectly live with that for now. And yeah, I'm just so happy with how well this works. And for the price as well, you know, being able to do all of this for probably about £100 and probably getting a better result than a commercial kit that costs way more, I'm extremely happy. So there you go. That was a look at my Hyper HDR based HDMI TV backlight system that I've built. And as you can tell, it works really well. Now, I will say if you're going into this, it's not a set and forget solution. You know, it's not like buying that Philips Hue Sync box where you'll plug it in and it will just work. With this, you've got to think of the compatibility, you've potentially got to solder and flash firmware. If you have little issues like mine where switching inputs causes it to drop out, you've got to figure out how to deal with that and come up with solutions. But if you're fairly technically inclined and want to do something like this, it's definitely a very achievable project and the end result is fantastic. So yeah, if you're interested in buying all this stuff, most of these things I bought from Amazon, so I've linked it all in the description and probably in a pinned comment as well, so you can take a look at that if you want to buy any of the hardware shown in this video. But yeah, it's definitely a very fun project and I am so happy with how it's turned out. It really adds to my TV experience and I think going forwards, if I didn't have this, I would really miss it. So yeah, there you go. Thank you very much for watching.